study ADHD and some of the social problems and social difficulties and issues that tend to come along with this disorder. And you know, many parents have just told me a lot of uh, heartwarming as well as heartbreaking stories about the social issues that their children are struggling with, and that's, that's motivated my work today. So um, I'd just like to open by asking you to think about your own childhood for a minute. So you know, go back to, zoom back to elementary school. And how many people can remember a child in your class who you would say nobody liked? Who always seemed to have trouble making, keeping friends, who other kids didn't want to work with, other kids didn't want to play with. Um, it seemed like this child couldn't get along with anybody in the classroom. Can anybody think of a child like that? OK, most of you can. So now what I want to ask you is um, if you had to try to put your finger on why it was, or what do you think is the main reason why this child had peer problems? What was like the main thing that you think was going wrong there? Um, tell me, like, just in like a brief phrase or one or two words, uh, what, were, what was the problem? What was happening? It affected social boundaries. Okay, uh, problems respecting social boundaries. What else have, what did you notice? What can you think of? Yes, sir. Uh, mm hmm. Okay. Um, what else can you think of? Distractibility. Okay, that was a big issue. Yeah, thank you. In the back, or somebody had somebody else. Okay, um, anybody else, one more? Not kind of being on the same page. Yeah, yeah, well, you know what, I'm glad that you brought up these things. I have you do this exercise for two reasons. The first is just to demonstrate that peer problems is something that um, is very memorable. You know, it stands out, like even to this day, most adults can remember kind of the, the social landscape when they were kids and they remember who didn't fit in. The second reason why I do this is in thinking about what your explanations are for the peer problems and why they happened. So you'll probably see that what most people brought up um, is when, in, and, and answering the question of why is it, you know, what went wrong, um, what was going on there, is uh, most of you came up with things that were problem behaviors in the child things that the child was doing that might be socially unskilled um, or that might be problematic. And you know, I like to, this is actually a very common conceptualization. I think that like 90% of the way that just humans in general, educators, researchers, clinicians think about social problems with ADHD is something that you know, I like to call the child deficit model. So this model is like, I'd say it's a dramatic oversimplifies, over, it's like dramatically oversimplifies the research there is out there on this, but it basically goes something like this. Um, the child is doing something that's really socially unskilled, and that behavior is turning off peers. You know, it's getting in the way of uh, these peer relationships. Peers see that, peers don't like it. And so, not surprisingly, peers respond with they don't want to be friends with the kid, they don't like the kid, they reject the kid, um, and this is what you see at the end result. Um, so while not saying, you know, this, this model, while not saying it's incorrect, because I think this absolutely is going on, and this doesn't even do justice to the rich amount of research like going into exactly what the different social skills deficits are. What I want to argue today and what I want you to, to leave you with is that the model is incomplete. It's part of the story, and an important part of the story, but it's not the whole story. So rather, what, something that I want to propose is that we need to think more broadly, and I call this the social contextual model. So what this is saying is that the child's behavior problems and social skills deficits and things that the child is doing that are annoying or disruptive, that's part of the issue that's turning off peers but it's not the whole story. So what else is there? We also have to think about the peers that have decided to dislike or exclude the child. So maybe some of you have noticed, right? Like some peer groups, 
are a lot more cliquish and hierarchical than other peer groups. It's like everybody's got a little group, everybody's really quick to decide you're in my group, you're out of my group, you know, you're my BFF, you're not. And other peer groups, it, it's a lot more fluid, right? Like, like some peer groups, they're just a lot more accepting of differences and more open to the idea that people have different ways of being and knowing and acting. So to the extent that like some peer groups tend to just really devalue quickly and be suspicious of other children who they think are different, as soon as those, peer, those peers are seeing you know, a child with ADHD symptoms or odd social behaviors, in those peer groups it might really go quickly, be like a really quick path to those peers saying, no, you're not like me, you can't hang out with me. And then the other thing that maybe some of you have noticed, right, is that once a child gets a negative reputation in the peer group, it can be really sticky. It can be really hard to shift. You know, there's a lot of psych psychological research now suggesting that peers actually have, they have these cognitive biases. So if they see another child do something that's like an ambiguous behavior or it's confusing why they're doing it, if peers don't like that child, then they will say, oh, well, the child's doing it on purpose and, that, you know, and the child's being mean. But if the peers like that child, then they'll be like, oh, well, you know what, that's nothing or it's just a misunderstanding. Um, so what this means is that it's like the peer group is, is biased to never change their impressions of somebody once they already have an impression. So if it's a negative impression, they just, they just look for things that reinforce that impression. And unless you kind of like really hit them over the head with it, they're actually like less inclined to change their mind. And that's something that I think really perpetuates the negative reputation and can really cement low social status. And so my point is that it's not just the child behavior problems, that's only half the story. The other half of the story in explaining why kids might be rejected or lack friends, we have to think about what is going on in the peer group to also make that happen. And uh, I also think that this could be like a vicious cycle. So once a child is rejected or doesn't, you know, doesn't have friends, then that child might be deprived of opportunities to learn or to practice social skills. And then that's a way that it can lead to further falling behind in positive social behaviors or social skills, which just kind of starts the cycle all over again and can really be reinforcing you know, in a very negative way. So um, if you, these different models have treatment implications. If you subscribe to that first model, the child deficit model, you know, then if you think to yourself, well, what do you want to do to try to help? You know, what do you want to do now that you have a, to try to fix the problem? Then what you would think to answer that question by is you want to teach the child to behave better. You know, let's try to teach that child social skills. Let's try to get them to stop doing the things that are really annoying their peers. And you break that cycle. And the assumption here, right, is that once you break that cycle, then peers will naturally notice that the behavior has changed, and peers will naturally change their mind and start to readjust their impressions, and you'll see results in the peers accepting and befriending that child more. However, if you subscribe to the social contextual model, then you would say, well, that's part of the story, and it's an important part of the story, but that is not the whole story. You're missing this whole other piece. Because you would say, okay, yeah, sure, you want to teach the child to enact better behavior, but you also need to be doing something. Like, what are we doing to also train the peer group to be more inclusive? What are we doing to provide opportunities to break the negative reputations that, you know, the peers might get their mind set in? If we need to do something to address these peer group factors in addition to the factors in the disliked child that might be contributing to rejection. If we want to have the best or most, you know, most promising, most efficacious effect on changing the social problems at the end of the day. Um, so uh, I want you to like think a minute about uh, kids with ADHD. 
Um, I know that this is going to be review for some of you, you know, already know a ton about ADHD, but this is a neurodevelopmental disorder affecting about 5% or so of school age kids. Uh, and you know, it's usually marked by a lot of difficulty paying attention and also difficulties with and or difficulties with hyperactivity and impulse control. Um, but what you may not know uh, is that children with this disorder have a lot of peer problems. A lot of trouble making, keeping friends. Um, they tend to be really very disliked. Um, gosh, you know, some, some, yeah, some studies have shown about 85% um, of kids with ADHD uh, are more, you know, are, would be classified as disliked or disliked by their peers. Uh, so it really is pretty high. You know, peers get very frustrated with kids with ADHD, and it happens extremely quickly. Um, they're, they're less often have actual friends. And another thing that's concerning is that even when they do have friends, there seem to be um, more conflict, less closeness. You know, it's less stable. They get along less well. So um, socially, this is really a big impairment for children with ADHD. And it's something that, you know, clinically, I think that families come in all the time talking about this as a concern and a persistent concern. And so, um, Let's get to like, why, why do we even care about this, right? Like, you know, as peer relationships, the sort of thing like, oh, it's nice to have, but it's one of those like nice to have things, it doesn't really matter. Um, well, it does matter. There's a couple of reasons why. Like, it, you know, they tend to not go away by themselves. So for kids with ADHD, it tends to continue on some of these peer problems. It tends to continue on in adolescence, as well as we are knowing more and more about adults with ADHD. That's kind of a really understudied population. But um, it seems to show up there, too, at least in terms of group averages, now that people are better able to look at for adults with ADHD, their relationships in the workplace, their romantic partnerships. And work that I've actually done, finding that when you observe them on Facebook, they actually have fewer supportive and positive comments from friends, more negative comments from friends on Facebook. Um, they, you know, they look less socially skilled and more dysregulated. So um, it probably is persistent throughout the lifespan, these sorts of social issues. Um, why else do we care about social problems? Um, so you probably heard this, that uh, children with ADHD, they're just at higher risk as a group for uh, adjustment difficulties and more psychopathology in adulthood. But what you have to know is that if they have peer problems as well, the risk increases. So it's like augmenting the risk that ADHD might already be having. And you know, why do we think it is? I mean, I think it's because um, if there's a child with ADHD who doesn't have good friends, doesn't have good peer relationships, um, School can become very negative. School can become like a very hard place to go, really unfun. And that can help make it, like encourage a child with ADHD to, to lose motivation for school or make it hard for them to concentrate on schoolwork, um, which can reduce learning. I also think that uh, you know, having no friends or being victimized can really increase loneliness or depression or anxiety. Um, it can also uh, reduce expectations that people are kind and out there to help you. You know, so these are all processes by which I think that having peer problems for years and years and years and years going through school can compound and can exacerbate some of the risks associated with ADHD alone for some of these negative outcomes. So um, how do we treat peer problems? What do we do? Uh, probably a number of you have heard of this study, the MTA study. It was, it's probably like the, uh, it was this, it was the, the, it was the largest clinical trial of children, of treatment for children with ADHD. Uh, it's almost 600 children with ADHD across multiple sites across the United States and Canada. And um, what you need to know is that the, the families, they were randomly assigned to one of four conditions. So either they got medication management, and this was done all by people in the study. It was really state of the art. It was done really intensively, like the monitoring and the titrating and the way that the medication was done was uh, par far more um, uh, 
involved than what you typically get in community care. Uh, same with behavior, or the children, another quarter of the kids were randomized to behavioral management, which included social skills training. And this was also really done in a state-of-the-art way, um, more intensive and probably better than what most families can get in the community, you know, run by psychologists. Uh, or another quarter of the children got both the medication and the behavioral treatment. So we thought of this as like the Cadillac of uh, treatment conditions, you're kind of throwing the best we know, the whole package of the best that we know at these kids. And then the last group were randomized to typical community care. So they were just, um, you know, they're just given a list of referrals and, needed, and just went out into the community to get the sort of treatment that was typically offered in the community. So um, what you need to know about the study is that med the medication, as well as the combination of medication and the behavioral treatment, was the most effective at reducing ADHD symptoms, as well as a lot of those co-occurring aggressive and oppositional behaviors. You really saw them go, go right down. Uh, they also were, the, the combination of medication and behavioral treatment, it was also the best at improving social skills as reported by parents and teachers. But then we asked the kids in the classroom, so the classroom peers of the kids with ADHD, who do you like? Who do you not like? What do you think of this child with ADHD? And what you have to understand is that there was no improvement on what the peers said. So the kids with ADHD, they still remained quite disliked quite rejected, regardless of which of the four treatment conditions they were in, and it didn't seem to make a difference which of the four treatment conditions they were in, in terms of improving that. So it didn't matter that these kids, the first three conditions, especially in the combined treatment with medication and behavioral, they got like the whole book thrown at them, the most state-of-the-art intensive treatments for 14 months that the study investigators had to throw at them, and it did not seem to make any difference in improving their peer rejection and their friendship in their actual classrooms. So when this, who's stunned right now? Anybody stunned? Okay, when this came out, a lot of people in the field, a lot of us, were stunned and depressed. You know, it feels like, my God, did we, you know, didn't we do everything? What else can you possibly do? And confused, because here's the thing. If you subscribe to the child deficit model, then this result is, is not just depressing, it is deeply, deeply confusing. Because you have, you've done this, right? Like, I know that it's not perfect, but uh, there are demonstrated significant improvements in ADHD symptoms, in aggressive and disruptive behavior, and even parents and teachers said that the social skills got better. But then why is this not following? Like, what is happening here? Uh, but I bet you have, I bet you can guess what I am going to say is happening. Because if you subscribe to the social contextual model, then you would think that, well, you've only, you know, you know, you've done something good, but it's only part of the problem. Like maybe it's that changing the child's problematic behavior is a necessary but not sufficient condition for changing peers' impressions. So it's part of the story. You need to start with that, probably. But if you don't do anything to try to address the biases in the peer group, that is also maintaining the peer rejection and lack of friendship for these kids with ADHD, then you know, you're not gonna get a complete result. And I think this is why also clinically, um, a lot of families tell me things like, well, you know, we've been giving medication or we've been doing behavioral management for you know, one, two, or three. My child was diagnosed when he was six and he's been on meds and we've been doing a whole bunch of behavioral management for you know, the last two or three years. And I think that in many ways it's helping. You know, it's made morning routine better, it's made homework go better. His teacher even says that he's doing better in class. But I really feel like the peer problems remain. 
And he's still not getting invited to birthday parties or play dates like the other kids. He's nine now and he's starting to notice. And I'm really starting to worry about him and that he's getting left behind. And I just don't know what else to do because we've been doing all these other things to try to manage the ADHD symptoms and yet I just don't see the result in peer relationships or I don't see enough of a result. You know, what should I do? And it's comments like that that have really motivated my work. Because I want to just ask you for a minute to reflect on this finding from the MTA study and like what I've just told you. Imagine that you're a child with ADHD and you've been in social skills training, you've gone to doctors who have like prescribed you meds, you've gotten a full day assessment to get evaluated for ADHD and you've been in social skills training or working with a therapist and you have been really working to improve your social behaviors. You have, you have like a daily report card, you have a behavior plan at school, your teacher is really like on you every day, your parents at home are rewarding you for better behavior that you're showing at school. You've been working hard and you're very aware that like you have a problem and now like you, you're, you know, you're starting to like show improvements and you're waiting and waiting and waiting for the peers to like you or to include you at recess or to invite you to a birthday party, and it is not coming and it is not happening. Try to put yourself in that perspective for a minute. How discouraging does that feel? You know, how much are you motivated to keep working on these sorts of things? You know, when all of us are trying to learn a new skill, like think about how much extra support we need from the people in our environment, especially as we're trying out a new skill and probably making mistakes and you know, fumbling as we're learning something new. So I just think about like how, how discouraging this must be for children who are getting all this treatment and maybe making behavioral gains, but it's like the peer group isn't noticing or they're not noticing enough. And that's something that has really motivated my work. So I'm actually gonna talk to you today about two intervention programs that we've been working on in my lab. Um, one is called Parental Friendship Coaching, and that's working with the parents of children with ADHD. The other is Making Socially Accepting Inclusive Classrooms or Mosaic, and that's working with teachers of children with ADHD. And both of these interventions follow the social contextual model, or the social contextual conceptualization, where we are trying to do things to encourage more positive behaviors in children with ADHD, but we're also trying to do things actively to change peers' perceptions of the children with ADHD at the same time. So both those two parts together. So um, parental friendship coaching. Um, this is a treatment that I wrote when I was at University of Virginia. Um, and uh, gosh, I probably wrote this like uh, probably eight or nine years ago. And we ran this small trial in University of Virginia um, that had 62 kids with ADHD, school age mostly, 62 typical children. And for the kids with ADHD, we randomly assigned them to receive parental friendship coaching or to be in a control group that didn't get treatment. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty small study, uh, it's a pretty small trial, but it was, it was the first one that we were trying. So what is parental friendship coaching? Well, it's parent groups and we have the parents come uh, for, this one was eight 90 minute sessions. We've now extended the program to be 10 sessions, still 90 minutes. And parents come in a group of you know, about five to seven parents. There are no child groups. So the children do not come for treatment. We just bring in the parents by themselves. And this is, a, this is something that I know that a lot of families aren't used to. But let me tell you what we do with the parents. So, um, Half of the treatment is training parents to instruct their child in social skills. And um, it's kind of like similar to what like a therapist, a social skills training therapist might do in the clinic if children came in. Except that what we're hoping here actually is that this may help increase generalization because the idea is that parents are with their kids, you know, well, for life. And parents also see their kids at home and, you know, on play dates and real life peer situations. The therapist can't do that just logistically. So parents are in a really good position to give their kids reminders and reinforcement and coaching in the heat of the moment in real life peer situations and even like after therapy ends in a way that it's just not feasible for therapists to do. 
So that's like half of the reason why we work with just parents alone and not the kids, and we work with parents so intensively. So we're training parents to just like do games and do coaching and do teaching with their child in social skills that we typically have therapists do. But this is the part that follows the child deficit model because it's like, how can the parents work with the kids to try to improve the kids' behaviors? However, we also have this part in red that follows the social contextual model where we're training parents to encourage peers' inclusiveness of kids of their own kids. How do you do that? Maybe you're thinking like, how in the world do you do that? Um, in some ways, it's easier said than done. It's mainly about trying to get the parent to get other kids and the parents of other kids to see their child and their family more favorably and to be more tolerant or more favorably inclined to support their child even when their child is making some behavioral mistakes. So what do we do there? Well, you know, a lot of it is just talking to the parents about how you make friends with other parents and how you socialize with other parents. Um, sometimes, for some parents, this comes really naturally, and for some parents, it really doesn't. I mean, I think that um, a lot of parents of children with ADHD, they, um, they feel a lot of shyness or they feel a lot of stigma. You know, there are definitely, there's a lot of misperceptions about ADHD out there, unfortunately, and there are sometimes there are other parents or teachers who really don't understand or they, you know, they have misperceptions that, you know, this isn't a real disorder or things like that, and so I think that hamp sometimes that restricts parents of kids with ADHD from feeling like they can get out there, you know. So we, you know, we really talk about that. I mean, you know, how can you get out there anyway, or how can you learn to like find people who are going to be understanding about your child's condition? How, and how do you figure out who those people are? And for people who aren't understanding, how are you able to kind of like take that in and just be like, well, that's their opinion, and like have the strength and confidence to just move on? It's not, this is not an easy thing to do. It is very unfair, I think, what we are asking. We're asking parents of kids with ADHD to be like super parents because we're asking them to do things that parents of typical kids are not being asked to do. But this is what I think the, their children often need. You know, their children need extra help. Um, and sometimes society is unfair. Um, so it is really pushing the parents to go out there and make friends with other parents and then arrange opportunities to socialize. Sometimes it's with the children of those other parents, because that's like a natural way to set up play dates. And then when they get out there and you know setting up play dates, a lot of it is about like how do you keep the play date really fun and structured? Basically, what you want is for to increase the likelihood that the child with ADHD and friend will get along and uh, will like each other. So, you know, a lot of parents of typical kids, they often don't understand this. You know, they, their child says, oh, I want to go out and play, and the mom goes, okay, fine, and then the kid goes, like, out in the street and then finds someone to play with, and then they come back, and everything's been fine, and they've made friends, and, you know, no fights have happened, like, nothing crazy has happened. But parents of kids with ADHD, they, they can't do this. If they just let things go naturally or let things be, um, they're, they're, you know, there's going to be a problem. So they uh, have to really organize the play date to make it fun. And this is a big part here. Like, how do you monitor the play date without looking like you're monitoring? So without like, looking like you're hovering or embarrassing your kid and looking weird, how do you like, stay really actually highly aware of what's going on so that if there are any problems that are starting to happen, you can like, distract and redirect? and like get it really early before it, um, it snowballs. Because this is probably what many kids with ADHD need, is parents who are doing this. But it's gonna look really weird if you're like standing over them. You know, because these are school age kids, they're not toddlers. So it's gonna look weird if you do that. So how do you like sneaky monitor? So we talk a lot about that. Um, and like I said, you know, we have this paper on this, like the stigma is a big barrier. It, it, it really is. So I think a lot of the work is about parents um, coming to terms with that or working through that something often with the support of other parents in the group. Um, you know, the other parents in the group are usually really, really great at being so supportive in, you know, helping parents understand that they're, you know, they're really not alone and how they can uh, reach out anyway despite some of these barriers in society and the unfairness. 
Um, so that's what we do with the parents for eight weeks in this trial, now currently 10 weeks in the new iteration. Um, and uh, in, this, in this brief trial, this initial trial, I'll tell you, we got some, we got some outcome measures. Um, since it was, a, it was a small trial, uh, we were limited in the measures that we got, but it's mainly parent and teacher reports of peer relationships. But we did also get observations of parents um, interacting with their children before and after the like, play dates that their children were actually having in this study. So I'm just going to show you a few slides of data from um, this initial trial. Um, so we found that uh, this is on the SSRS. A lot of you will know that measure. So it's, so, it's the social skills. It's reporting on the child's social skills. 100 is the, the average standard deviation of 15. So you can see here that um, for the families of children with ADHD who went through the intervention, that's the red line, from before group to after the treatment, the parents are reporting a significant increase in the child's social skills. This was not the case for the parents of children with ADHD who were randomized to not get treatment. But I put that dotted black line up there for a reason. Those are the children without ADHD who were followed, none of whom got treatment, who were followed over the exact same period in the study. So you can see that, you know, I mean, maybe this is not like surprising, but you know, eight weeks of parent groups has not normalized the children with ADHD on this measure, at least by parent report. Um, on the other hand, interestingly enough, uh, we also did have parents report on the amount of conflict in play dates. This is a, Fred Frankel uses this measure for, you know, some of you may know his, his intervention group. Uh, this is his measure. And here's a situation where you do see that the parents of kids with ADHD who got parental friendship coaching, this red line, they actually are reporting, I mean, a significant decrease in conflict to the level of what parents of the typical kids the amount of conflict that parents of typical kids are reporting over that same period. Uh, but this is not true for the blue line. That's the parents of kids with ADHD who did not get the treatment. So at this point, you might also be thinking, well, this is like well and good, and this is promising. But you know, the parents all knew they were getting treatment. So isn't there kind of pressure on them to say their kids were getting better? Um, and yes, I agree with that. So we were more encouraged that the teachers who did not know who was getting treatment or not, reported some similar patterns. So here we asked the teachers, you know, will you estimate the proportion of children in your classroom who you would say like this target child with ADHD? And they just gave us an estimate. That's what's on the y-axis here. So you can see that actually for the teachers of the children with ADHD who, whose parents went through the group, the teachers are reporting an increase over the study period, whereas they're actually reporting a decrease for the kids who did not, whose parents did not go through the group. However, on the other hand, you look at that black dotted line, that's what the teachers of the typical kids are reporting, that pretty much close to 100% of peers like the typical kids, and that's like staying standard over the study period. So again, like kind of like with the parent data, um, some promising um, findings that maybe we are moving things or nudging things in the right direction with this treatment, but we are obviously, this is a far cry, from normalization. Um, on the other hand, what I was also encouraged by is, you know, we videotaped the parents doing, uh, interacting with their kids before and after a play date. Um, as a result, you know, before and after, like before they started treatment and then after they did, they finished treatment. And we also found changes in the way that they were positively interacting and the sorts of like coaching and facilitation that they were doing with their kids. And this is from um, observers who didn't know who went through treatment or not, and didn't know who had ADHD or not. So that is encouraging. And then we did this model. This is a mediation model for those uh, researchers out there in the room, and which showed that um, the effects of receiving treatment on both parent and teacher ratings of child-peer relationships, it was mediated or partially accounted for by changes over the course of the study period in how well the parents were observed to be coaching their kids. So to me, that's exciting because it reinforces like the whole theoretical model of the study, that the, the benefits that you might see as a result of treatment come through the pathway of parents doing a better job 
in their interactions with the kids and in the coaching that they're doing with their kids around play dates or right before and after play dates. So that was exciting to me. Um, we also looked at, in some other papers, we've also looked at some moderators of treatment. So moderators, you know, meaning like, did the, did, was treatment just, did the treatment work as well for all groups equally? Or did treatment work better for some groups relative to other groups? So we looked at gender, you know, so did treatment work better for boys or for girls or was it the same? We looked at like child age, remember it's a narrow age range, but you know, six through 10, like did age make a difference in how well treatment worked? Child comorbidities, whether or not they were on medication, about 60% of the children were medicated, um, whether they're inattentive or combined subtype. So what do you think mattered in terms of affecting how effective the treatment was? Well, I'll cut to the chase. None of these things seem to matter. At least it's a, it's a small sample, at least in the small sample. But you know what did matter? Parental ADHD. So you know ADHD runs in families. So you know parents of kids with ADHD are more likely, statistically you know, on average, to be dealing with their own ADHD. And we found this you know, in two, two, two studies on the sample that uh, if the parents had ADHD symptoms themselves, they seemed to benefit less from treatment. That actually gave us a lot of pause. You know, like we didn't, when we started this treatment, we weren't thinking this, like parental ADHD really wasn't on our radar, like we were just trying to do this treatment that would help the most kids as possible. But after we found this out, it really like caused us to kind of self-reflect a lot and be like, well, what is needed? To, make, to support, to better support the parents who have their own ADHD symptoms. And you know, what, what, what could we add or what could we change in parental friendship coaching to be more of a support? You know, why, why is it that this is happening? Um, I'm still not totally sure why it is that this is happening, but you know, I suspect what we think, like we tried to look into it, um, it might just be because, you know, we're asking the parents to go, we're, we're, we're throwing a lot of skills at them, so they have to like listen to that and take that all in and pay attention. Then we expect them to go home and, inter and at, we expect them to do homework by enacting and delivering like all those skills with their kids. And you know, this is just, this is just a hard thing for probably any parent to do. But parents who are struggling with their own ADHD symptoms themselves, they probably need extra support and reminders and structure and how to do this, just like, just like their kids do. And um, I, I suspect that they just weren't you know, enacting the skills or the homework as, as frequently or as consistently. You know, so we've thought a lot about what we can do to try to better support that population. Um, and it, is, it does lead to what we're doing now. So um, we have just finished year four in a five-year, much larger, dual-site clinical trial. Um, one of the sites is in Vancouver, where I am, and uh, Canada, and the other site is in Quebec, which is the eastern side of Canada, where everybody speaks French. And so this whole treatment got translated into French. Every time I go over there, I'm freezing and everybody's speaking French at me. So it has been, it has been a really interesting experience doing, doing this uh, dual site study with my co-PI, Sebastian Normand, over there. So um, what we have been doing is, I told you, we actually have just finished year four and we have enrolled in, uh, 175 families across the two sites. So it's a much bigger study, it's a much bigger trial. Um, these are family, all families of kids with ADHD ages 6 to 11 who have ADHD and social problems. And um, they have, this is all the families that we are going to enroll, so we have actually closed enrollment. Um, almost all of them have completed, you know, went through the whole intervention and got like the whole treatment and did not drop out. Um, but some changes that we've done compared to the initial study that I told you is now we're actually randomizing them. All the parents are getting treatment. So half of them are getting parental friendship coaching and the other half go into a psychoed, psychoeducation and support group. Whereas in the previous trial, the, um, the, you know, the, the other half just didn't get any intervention. Um, so this is a change because we're trying to give everybody something and we're just trying to see um, if uh, you know, the different ways that, we actually, I actually think that psychoed and support will also really help families too. 
I just think that parental friendship coaching might help in different ways or more, maybe more specifically for the friendship problems, but it's something, it's a hypothesis to test, right? Like we, you know, we have yet to see this. And um, now we're doing, we're doing post-tests immediately after intervention is over. We're collecting data now on like this last, this, the last kind of 25 that have like just finished groups. But we also have a follow-up in this design. So one year after they finish the groups, we bring them back in just to see how things are going, you know, what might have changed, what might have stayed the same. Um, and that is a new thing that we have added to the current study that was not in the previous study because, you know, it's important, right? Like sometimes we invest, as researchers, we invest a lot of work into trying to do these treatments and then we just look at what things are like immediately afterwards and then we're like, okay, good luck. But uh, obviously that's not, life goes on and children grow up and it's important to try to see um, how things may have changed or stayed the same um, over the course of time. So I know one year really isn't that long, but this is at least our attempt to look at it. So um, because not all the measures, our outcome measures are finished yet, we have not looked at all at treatment effects. So not one bit, this is, this is, this is like for ethical reasons, like we, you know, we want to finish everything before we look at the question of did parental friendship coaching, did it help, did it not help? So I have nothing to tell you about whether the treatment was helpful or not in this larger sample, although I hope that I'll be able to tell you about it actually very soon. I think we'll learn a lot, but I'm not sure what the answer is. However, what we have been looking at in this sample now is um, questions largely from just the baseline data from the beginning. We're starting to look at this, um, and it's not about did treatment work, but it's just questions about you know, how children and their families with ADHD might be functioning, and we've been presenting this at a lot of conferences or we're about to present it. So um, I'm gonna just give you a snapshot of some of the things that we have found so far. This is my lab. This is my wonderful lab at, at University of British Columbia. Um, we went to a trapeze school and so, you know, then so we all decide to wear costumes because, you know, um, you should. So um, uh, Mary, who is uh, the, the chipmunk up here, she did analyses finding that, you know, children with ADHD, they're more at risk for victimization, getting victimized, as, as well as bullying. Um, and if they, you know, if they have internalizing problems, so like depression, anxiety, uh, it seems that they're even more at risk for getting victimized. But she's found that um, the number of friends that they have in the classroom, as well as how good quality those friends are, that tends to reduce the likelihood that they're going to be victimized. And that's something that she's uh, presenting this summer at uh, the ISRCAP conference. Um, Sophie, who is my first year and who is the elephant, she has been looking at parental ADHD and parental depression. So, you know, I told you that these, these, uh, these things are more common, unfortunately, in parents of children with ADHD as compared to in the typical population. And um, she's finding that parents with depression, parents of children with ADHD who have depressive symptoms, they seem to have more trouble with involvement and positive involvement and engagement in their parenting. But parents of children with ADHD who have ADHD symptoms are tending to have more difficulties in being structured in parenting. And what's cool about this analysis, I think, is that um, she's finding that uh, the depression and involvement link, it is holding after you account for the ADHD symptoms that the parent might have and the ADHD structure link is holding after you account for the depressive symptoms that the parent might have. So these are different types of psychopathologies in parents of children with ADHD that may have like slightly different results. It's important for thinking about treatment. So then Audrey, he is the peacock back here. Um, his analysis, he was looking at um, the extent to which parents are facilitating children's friendships at baseline, so before they even get any treatment all, at all. And he's finding that, like, you know, who knows what happened after we gave them treatment, but what they were doing just initially, it seems to predict children and their friends saying that they have a better friendship three months later, after you account for where they, their friendship already was three months before. So to me, this is exciting because um, it strengthens the idea that 
like maybe trying to train parents to do these sorts of things is a good thing or will have positive benefits. And then Jen, who is Batman in the back, um, Jennifer has really been looking at parental stigma. So affiliate stigma, that's the extent to which parents feel really embarrassed or ashamed by their children's ADHD symptoms. You know, they feel like other parents are gonna think, I think that I'm a bad parent, other parents are looking at me, other parents don't, are judging me negatively. So she found that for parents who feel this way, um, it is predicting increases in their, their negative or harsh parenting to their child over a short term course of three months. And um, you know, we think that it's because if, if you feel affiliate stigma, then that can create a lot of like urgency to try to get your child to stop the negative behavior. You know, if your child's behavior is completely mortifying to you, then that can create like a lot of pressure to just want to make your child stop that right now. But I think that what that comes out as often, like when we're seeing it, at least in the lab, is it can come out as like a lot of harshness or a lot of criticism or a lot of like over control. And so that's what I think that we're finding. And to me, that you know, underscores the potential importance of, you know, the thing about like how a group process of having parents supporting each other in the group or knowing that just other families are going through the same thing, you know, how that can help to, to really reduce stigma and to you know, help parents have a greater understanding that um, other people understand or other people, you know, maybe not everybody, but some people are you know, out there to be supportive and to be understanding. So, okay, so I have talked to you so far about parental friendship coaching, which is the first intervention. And um, the next part I want to talk to you about is um, making socially accepting inclusive classrooms. So this is, this is the second intervention working with the teachers. So um, I also wrote this program when I was at University of Virginia and we did this like small trial like five years ago um, with 24 kids with ADHD, 113 typical kids because we wanted to make it more of like a regular, closer to like a regular ratio of kids with ADHD to typical kids in a classroom. And basically I created a summer camp just for the purposes of the study to try to test um, Mosaic. And uh, all the kids were enrolled in summer camp. They were all previously unacquainted when they started camp, so they didn't know anybody. And the kids with ADHD, they um, were, it was a repeated measures crossover design. So they got two weeks where they were in a classroom that was doing mosaic, and then two weeks in a comparison intervention condition. So the comparison condition, let me tell you about, we called Comet. And this is pretty standard um, behavioral management that we work with teachers of kids with ADHD to do. So what's key here is that it's all about trying to reduce the negative behaviors of kids with ADHD. So it's behavior plans and charts, it's social skills training, it's lots of reminders and reinforcements. Like this is stuff that good teachers are doing to try to manage the behavior problems of kids with ADHD. But it follows the child deficit conceptualization, remember because all this is really about is how do we fix the behavior problems of the kids with ADHD. Now, by contrast in Mosaic, what we did, it follows the social contextual conceptualization because it's two parts. We're having the teachers do the similar behavioral management and social skills training to try to address the problem behaviors of the kids with ADHD. So that's the part to address the child deficits. But we also are training teachers to try to create a more socially inclusive and, incl and, and accepting classroom environment where the peers are more accepting of kids with ADHD and where children's reputations are more malleable as opposed to you know, the child with ADHD gets a negative reputation and then they're, they're really stuck with that for the rest of the school year or you know, for the rest of the time in their school. So um, what are we doing to do this red part? Again, this is sometimes like more easily said than done. But um, let me tell you, the, the, the underlying assumption here for the social contextual part is that young children, when they're trying to judge who they like and who they don't like and who, you know, what they think of their peers in the classroom, they are in part making their social judgments based on how they see their teacher interacting with those children. So if their teacher seems to genuinely like and value those children, 
Young children will in some ways take cues for that and use that as a model to follow in their own judgments and in their own evaluation behavior toward those children. But if the teacher seems very frustrated with those children or just like, you know, really doesn't want anything to do with those children or like, like has to tolerate them, then young children pick that up. Even if the teacher does, doesn't say this out loud, like even if it's like communicated non-verbally, I think, um, young children are actually really good at picking this up. And then they will be more negatively inclined toward those kids. So, you know, so obviously you probably are aware of this. Children with ADHD can be very frustrating in the classroom. Teachers can get very frustrated with them um, because their behaviors are, can be quite difficult and quite trying. So, but how can you, we in Mosaic, what we're encouraging teachers to do is how do you develop really genuine, positive, warm relationships, well, with all kids, but especially kids with ADHD, so that you genuinely like them, and that comes through even if and when you are correcting their behavior, which you have to do when you, you know, with a child with ADHD. I mean, you have to do that a lot. Um, how are, can teachers find genuine things that they really like about that child that that child is good at? And how can they call attention to that in front of the peer group and highlight it for peers? And because probably these are kids who the teacher is not going to be praising a lot for behavioral compliance or following rules. So how can you find things like whether it's like artistic ability or dance ability or something that the child is genuinely better at than everybody else in the classroom or than most other kids and the teacher can call that out and make a point to notice that. Um, how can the teachers be just setting like a classroom culture where children need to include each other and they think to do that and to help each other, where children are more, have more of the idea that, you know, everybody's working on something. Everybody has like strengths and difficulties and, but that's okay, we all have something. You know, as opposed to thinking like, you have more problems with that than me, you are worth less than me. You know, how do you communicate that as a teacher, right? Um, and then when teachers need to correct behavior, which they do a lot with kids with ADHD, we, we encourage them, like, how do you do it in a way that preserves the child's reputation? You know, is there a way to do it and that seems respectful and that seems more discreet? Um, so this is stuff we're working on with the teachers. Um, something else that you should know about Mosaic is it's more of a, it's not a lesson plan. It's more of like, I call it an approach. So it's a way of interacting between teachers and students that can be all day. Like it can happen during academic lessons, during any academic content. It can happen during transitions. Um, so whatever the content is, it doesn't matter because it's more of a way of interacting with kids. And my hope is that it's, that helps to make it more palatable to teachers because it's not like taking time out specifically out of their day when they normally would be you know, having to like teach content um, to, to work on this. This can just be imbued in the ways, the things that they're already doing. So um, in this small trial, so remember this is summer camp, so it's not real school, but it's summer camp, previously unacquainted kids, they didn't know each other at all after two weeks. What we relied a lot on for the outcome measures is we asked the other kids in the summer camp classroom, you know, who do you like, who do you not like? This is often considered the gold standard in terms of evaluating like interventions for peer relationship problems, as opposed to just asking the parents and teachers. Um, we also observed their peer relationships like at recess and lunch when the teacher wasn't there. And we had them do these memory books at the end of the summer where they wrote like, like yearbooks to their, their uh, classmates. We took them home overnight. We ran all of them on the photocopier, gave them back to the, the kids the next day, and we had research assistants who didn't know anything about the kids or what treatment they were in or even who they were code how positive the messages were to each kid in these yearbooks. And what we found, um, so um, I'm gonna break this up by the results up by gender, right? It's 50% boys, 50% girls in this trial. And you're gonna see in a minute like why I'm breaking it up by gender because there's a pretty consistent pattern. So this is the proportion of peers who said, I like this child. So you can see that, let's first talk about the red bar. So these are the boys with ADHD. So when the boys with ADHD were in mosaic, that's this red dotted line, about a little, you know, 36% of their peers, that's what the y-axis means, about 36% of their peers in the classroom said, name this child as somebody I like. 
But when these boys with ADHD were in Comet, that's the one that just focuses on managing their behavior without the parts that deal with the peer group and the social contextual factors. Um, only about 26% of their peers said, I like this child, and that's a significant difference. On the other hand, we did not find that pattern for the girls. It just didn't seem to matter for the girls, whether they were in Comet or whether in Mosaic, what type of treatment they were in, in terms of what the peers said, at least in the study. So this is like the answer to the question, who do you dislike in this class? So, um, you know, it's probably enough for the, for the boys with ADHD, when they were in the behavioral management comet, so the child deficit model treatment, 35% of their peers were saying, I dislike this kid. But when they went to Mosaic, that targeted the peer group factors, that dropped to 20% of their peers saying, I dislike this kid. By the way, if you want like references, we also, you know, we got this data on the typical kids. Typical kids, it's like 5%. So we still are not normalizing, okay, just to put that out there. But it is a significant decrease for the boys when they were in classrooms doing mosaic in terms of their peers saying they dislike them. That's not true for the girls. Um, reciprocated friendships, so for the boys, it shoots up so much higher when they're in mosaic. Children saying, I'm your friend. The boy also says, I'm your friend too. This just doesn't seem to be happening for the girls. Like this treatment is like not having any effect on our girls with ADHD. Um, on the other hand, there is a slight pattern where this is a rating scale where we just said, you know, rate this child from one to five. How much do you like them? For the record, three is neutral. One is dislike a lot. So if you look at the y-axis, you have to realize that all these children with ADHD are disliked. However, here is actually, I think that ratings are, they're more sensitive to just being like, who do you like and who do you not like? Like, they're more sensitive because it's on a continuum. So here we actually do find some potential evidence that even for the girls, they might be getting slightly more liked in Mosaic, but like, it's, it's, this is not overwhelming, right? Like, I find this very underwhelming for the girls, at least, even though I was very encouraged by the boys' data. Um, so you might be thinking, like, maybe this just has to do with how girls answer questions relative to boys, you know, and who do you like, who do you not like. But the observational data actually bore out the same pattern, which made me more confident in the results from the question. Um, we observed the negative peer interactions they were having at recess and lunch, and there's actually this pattern that for boys, when they're in mosaic, they drop. But for girls, that is totally not true. Like, they're the same, or if anything, they actually increase. And then we looked at the proportion of time that they spent in groups of like, you know, two or three or more peers as opposed to alone at recess and lunch. And sure enough, for the boys when they're in Mosaic, they, they're just naturalistically hanging out more in groups instead of being alone. This is not true for the girls. That just doesn't make a lick of difference. And for positive peer messages, remember I said that we photocopied and we Xeroxed their yearbooks for boys that is increasing when, well, the boys are less positive period, but I think they just wrote less. But um, there, there's more, you know, some, some gender differences continue throughout life. Um, but, the, but when the boys were in Mosaic, they received more positive peer messages in their yearbook compared to when they were in Comet. This was not true for the girls. So, you know, it probably begs the question, like, what is going on with these girls? Um, I don't entirely know yet, but I think that what it is is that you know, in order to get in the study, we actually had girls who were, had pretty severe ADHD symptoms. They were actually just as severe as our boy group in terms of the ADHD symptoms. So you have to understand that like, you know, ADHD is a diagnosis that's about three times more common in boys than in girls. And when you look at like, kids coming to clinics, it might even be like a nine to one ratio of boys versus girls who are presenting to clinics. So you know, their behavior problems are so severe that they you know, need to come in for treatment. So, um, but we have a gender neutral diagnostic criteria. So in order for, what this means is that there are just way more boys out there in the natural classroom who are either passing diagnostic criteria or they're approaching it and for girls, just the typical behavior is way lower on ADHD symptoms. So we have these girls now in this group who their behavior, the girls with ADHD, their behavior is as extreme as the boys with ADHD. But compared to the rest of the girls in their classroom, there's this huge gap. Whereas the boys with ADHD compared to the rest of the boys in their classroom, there's less of a gap 
You know, it's, it's more of a gradation. And I just think that that contrast was probably like a big deal. We also had um, classrooms that were single sex in the summer program, which is something I would not do again. But, the, but I think that that might have just accentuated the contrast, because now we have girls hanging out with all girls being rated by girls. And I think that in a regular classroom during the school year, where it's both genders and we also have more girls who are not just you know, really, really high at ADHD symptoms, you have more girls with like lower ADHD symptoms too. Um, it just, you know, maybe the contrast will not look as extreme and a treatment like Mosaic will work better. Or at least that's what I'm hoping and hoping to find out. Oh, um, by the way, uh, this is just new stuff. We just came out with this. The most effective teacher practice of these, turns out, because we tell the teachers to do all this, turns out it was actually highlighting genuine strengths that seemed to really show up as like, of all these teacher practices that we taught the teacher to do, the one that was most uniquely linked to um, improving peers' impressions of the kids with ADHD. So, you know, that would be like, like if there's any teachers in the room or educators, be like I said, like really take the time to try to think, what is this kid genuinely good at in something that, it's gotta be real, right? Like you can't just like make it up. But what do I really respect about this kid that this kid is good at? And you might need to stretch a bit to think about things, like it might take some time to think about things. You might need to ask the child themselves to brainstorm about it or the child's parents to brainstorm about it. Um, but if you can figure that out, being able to find ways to call attention to that or highlight it, particularly in front of peers, might be one of the most like single effective things that you can do to change peers' impressions. So, um, oh, we also looked at mosaic effects on the typically developing classmates. And I think this is important because, you know, teachers might be like, well, this is all well and good that this is helping the kids with ADHD, but you know, this is like a lot of time, so is this gonna like take away from my ability to deal with the rest of the kids in the classroom? Is it going to help them? Is it gonna hurt them? Is it gonna be neutral? It helps them. So for the typical kids who receive Mosaic, they also were better liked and had better peer relationships, but the effect sizes were small. Whereas for the kids with ADHD, the change, the effect size, meaning like kind of like a, a metric of change, it was really big but for the typical kids, it was there still, but it was just much smaller. So to me, this um, suggests that Mosaic might be useful for all, but essential for some. So, you know, more like it can help everybody, but there's some kids who really, really, really need it, whereas for other kids, it just, you know, it gives them like a nice or a positive boost. And that's something that I think is potentially hopeful for helping teachers to know in the future and the uptake of this program, because that's what we're doing now. So we have just finished year one of a three-year plan, three-year study, to roll Mosaic out to regular classrooms during the school year. Remember what I told you before, all the results I showed you? That's summer camp. So what about like during the school year when kids already know each other, when teachers have academic demands, you know, when kids have like a long time, they, when kids have, have negative reputations, but they also have a lot of opportunities to form positive bonds? So we're trying this now. That's what we're doing. Um, this is a dual site study between you know, me and Julie Owens over in Ohio. So we have been working with um, a very small group of teachers this past year, just this past academic year, finishing like this month, uh, K through three classrooms. And um, just working with teachers for getting their ideas about how to revise the strategies to be effective in general education classrooms during the school year. Um, next two years, we, ro we ro roll out more and more with uh, more and more teachers and more and more data collection to try to evaluate the efficacy of this program. So um, really briefly, just some of the initial lessons that we've learned from the study from our teachers this year. Um, one of the things that we talk to the teachers about is um, how they can build, like I said, build a positive relationship with the child. And so one of the ways to do that, and this also helps with identifying the genuine strengths, is we tell them, you know, can you have like a dedicated time of day where you do like a special time with the child where you get to know the child better, you take an interest in something the child cares about, you let the child take the lead without teaching or correcting, you try to ignore minor misbehavior, and you really like relax and enjoy the child, it's like a bonding moment. And these teachers were like, well that sounds awesome, I'd love to do that, I don't know when I'm gonna do that in my school day, because you know, I've got all these other kids and I'm supposed to be teaching things. When am I supposed to do that? And I said, I don't know when you're supposed to do that. Like, why don't you, you know, I want you to tell me. 
because, you know, because we need to figure out how to make this feasible in regular classrooms. But you know what? They figured it out. So a lot of them are doing it during center times. A lot of them came up with like ways to actually make other kids during that time like a teacher's aide or a helper so that they were less often disturbed by other kids coming up and disrupting or interrupting them when they were trying to do the targeted special time with the child with ADHD. Um, we also worked with the teachers about like how do you do a question of the day. So this teacher is asking, would you rather be a caterpillar or a tadpole? And the kids like decide what they'd rather be. And, you know, she does this to, like, we have them do this to highlight connections between kids. Because to the extent that kids tend to think, like, you're in my in-group, you're in my out-group, this helps kids be more flexible in realizing what they actually have in common with peers that they might not have thought that they had something in common with. And, you know, no one day of doing this is going to work overnight or change everybody's impressions. It's just that you do this over and over and over again. And then over time, you break down some of those clicks is the idea. So um, in summary, I hope that like what I'll leave you with and what I hope that I've convinced you with today is that in order to best address or think about peer problems, we probably need to be thinking broadly. We should be thinking about ch the children's social skills deficits and things that the kids are doing that might be negative and turning off peers, but we can't just stop there. If we stop there, it's incomplete. We haven't gone the whole way. And if we want to just be more comprehensive and hopefully, hopefully better at treating peer problems, we also have to think more and more in terms of the social contextual model about things in the peer group that we can also address to help peers be more socially inclusive and help peers break some of the negative reputations that they have. Um, and uh, that I hope that this, you know, I'm inspired by this. Like, I hope that this will be just a way to better addressing a lot of the peer problems that we see that can be very stubborn and hurtful and um, treatment refractory. So with all that said, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to thank a lot of people and funding who've helped me, and I welcome your questions. The Mosaic program, hmm. aside from having teachers comment on a child's genuine strengths or whatever, what are the actual strategies for teaching the peers to be more inclusive? Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't understand, what do we do? I, I get the research, but yeah, the actual no, techniques. Thank you, thank you for asking that um, and giving me the opportunity to, to, to be more clear about that. I felt like I was running out of time. The premise is that when peers see teachers calling attention to personal strengths in kids or taking like a sincere and positive interest with kids and liking kids, then peers change their own impressions of that kid. Like it's kind of like the peer is thinking, oh, you know, the teacher likes this child, the teacher values this child, um, maybe I should too. Or it's like with the genuine strengths, the peers are thinking, oh, wow, okay, um, so-and-so really is good at that. That isn't something that I've noticed before even though the teacher might be, even though he doesn't pay attention very well, or the teacher might be correcting his behavior problems a lot, the, this, he is also really good at this other thing, and it balances out. So that's the so theory. Under the umbrella, those really are the techniques. There yeah. are like other strategies where you're taking the peers and teaching them specific behaviors or specific activities. That is a super good question. More of the strategies, uh, there's a lot of strategies, so some of them do involve talking to the peers more directly, but more of the strategies are about things that the teacher actually does as opposed to things the teacher says to the class. So it's more like the teacher modeling that he or she you know, really likes and respects and includes children who are different, as opposed to the teacher saying things verbally to the class like, we really need to be accepting of differences, or you know, let's talk about Johnny. Johnny's brain works differently. You need to all be nice to him. Yeah, so it's more about what the teacher does and how the teacher treats Johnny than what the teacher says to the peers about how the peers should do it. Hi, um, thank you for doing this type of research and bringing it to us here. I really appreciate it because um, it's something that really impacts my life and my family's life. So thank you for everything that you and your team have has done and for the mind for having us here. A um, couple of questions. So 
I'm thinking what I just heard. I have a daughter who's 10 and a half, and good God, nothing's going to help her. Or because the social skills stuff, yeah. it didn't really make a huge difference. Um, medication, social skills training may make a difference in the classroom with the teacher. But with peers, it sounds like right now the, the, the um, research is not really strongly showing a big difference. So I just want to make sure that I'm summarizing, or at least I got the point of what you were presenting. And it looks like most of your studies are with maybe a little bit younger yeah. subset. Mm -hmm. So what can you say about girls? I mean, are we even more screwed? Um, going into 11, 12, and 13. And is just Mosaic, is it something that you guys created and like copyrighted, or is it like some something off the shelf that you found and implemented? Yeah. Um, okay, uh, you need to remind me of some of your, you're gonna need to remind me of some of your questions uh, too. Um, yeah, 11, 12, 13, girls, that's a hard age for anybody, whether or not you have ADHD. So I, mean, I just I just want to acknowledge that um, you know I think I think it's tough. There's just there's like a lot of social dynamics going on. Um, in terms of like what you might be able to do about it, you know, as as a parent or you know as a teacher, I mean I think some a lot of these principles still apply in terms of what I talked about. But you have to like think about how to do it in an age appropriate way, because you know teenagers will want more autonomy and. They, they deserve more autonomy. So if teachers are really like over the top positive about like something that a teenager is doing, that might actually backfire. So I think it's like the same principle that if teachers like take a genuine personal interest and find things they really like about you know, a middle schooler, then that will set a positive model for peers to follow. But you know, teachers of young kids can be like, look, you rocked that, look, you rocked that, give me a high five and stuff. And you know, obviously teenagers aren't gonna go for that or if peers see that, that's actually gonna look weirder. So I think you have to be more careful. And in terms of like parents, in terms of what you're doing, it'd be great to like think about a way to facilitate play dates and relationships, but you know, you have to be, you just have to be more cautious because at that age, it's becoming you know, more and more on her to reach out or to decide who she likes and who she doesn't like. And, but that's, that's developmentally appropriate, I would say. And Mosaic, did you guys create? Oh, yeah, yeah, we did, we did. So, I mean, they're not like brand new ideas, of course. Um, yeah, but it is, it is a program that we created. Um, my actual hope is that you know, in another two years, once we See, you know, I wrote this, and we tried it in the summer camp, and you know, summer camp is not real school, so who knows what's going on. But um, my hope is that, like, after another two years, we really will have gone through revising this manual and testing it out, and you know, getting it to work in the real life school context, and like that'll be a time when hopefully it'll be more, you know, if it seems like the data is supporting it, then it'll be you know more ready for other teachers and other people to to try it out in school. Thank you for your comments and your interest. Did you have a question? Hi. Hi. I really uh, enjoyed the presentation and it seemed like it's a real holistic approach you know, that you're, you're taking a, of uh, interaction. Uh, and, and when you interview the parents and, and, and then I try to get them to be proactive wellness of their child, uh, do you also include positivity thinking uh, along with that? I know you, you said you try to find, you know, find out from the parent or from the child mm -hmm. what the kid thinks they're good at mm -hmm. and, or what the parent thinks they're good at so that you can share that with, with the peer groups. Uh, now, do you guys also include a positive, positive part where you, where you try to get the kids to see the you know their what they can accomplish and yes yeah, yeah a that's training really and if their behavior changes these things can be accomplished and that sort of thing mm -hmm. is that part of it yeah thank you for bringing that up that's a really great and important question um that actually is what we spend uh, the first kind of three weeks on in parental friendship coaching um, the whole logic of that there is is that if parents are going to be effective social coaches for
for their kids with ADHD. Um, they need to do everything possible to help encourage their kid with ADHD to listen to them and to take in their coaching. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you, especially if you have kids, whether or not they have ADHD, you have noticed or you have the issue where you try and give advice, and maybe it's really good advice. You know it's good advice. And you, have, you really have your kid's best interest in mind. And then your kid goes, I know, Mom, or I already do that, or you don't need, you don't need to tell me that. The wall, like the wall goes up. Like, yeah, it sounds like some of you have heard that. So, I mean, I think that this is really common, though, and then it's probably magnified for kids with ADHD because if they're hearing over and over and over corrections and changes over and over and over, that can just, like, get really demoralizing. So the first whole chunk of the group is really about um, helping parents to build that positive relationship with their kid, helping parents understand that change is possible, helping kids understand that change is possible and that the parent believes in them, and helping the parent get more effective at delivering messages or delivering feedback, you know, in a way that seems very supportive and non-critical and is like not overwhelming to the child. Because we do that first, because I think that's like the foundation on which like any of the coaching needs to ride. So thank you for giving me a chance to explain that. So I realize that I'm extrapolating here, <laughs> which you can't do in research really. But as a parent, um, I'm wondering, you know, with the, the interaction, so you treat your child in a positive way and try to have positive reinforcement and, and uh, really pointing out just, you know, your kid need, my, is learning just like every other kid. Yep. But how important is it for, uh, in these peer interactions, would it, I'm, I'm thinking more sort of like, you know, the mosaic model where the kids are looking up to the adult to, to judge how they're going to treat that child. Yep. Is it more effective? Because, you know, I deal with this with the, the cousins and the, the neighbor kids and everything. Is it more effective if the other parents are looking at the child and mm -hmm. saying, you know, what positive things are there than just me as mom? Yeah, well, you hope that if you are doing it as the mom, then it, 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 it trickles out and then if the two children develop good for good friendship, then the, the other parent of the peer is able to notice it. I'll also say that I think parents of children with ADHD, they're in a real bind during play dates. Like, if their kid is starting to act up, you know, what do you do in this situation? I mean, if your kid is acting up too much, you definitely need to stop that behavior because the peer, the friend is gonna notice and is not gonna like it. But on the other hand, like you don't want to make too big of a deal out of it because if th you don't want the friend to then go away thinking that your child has behavior problems or that it's like a big deal. So a lot of it is also about like finding ways to kind of stop and divert the behavior without, well, that effectively stops it or reduces it, but that is not like drawing a lot of attention to it. And then you talk about it with your child later. So I think that that's, that's a lot of what we're trying to work with the parents on doing. It's easier said than done, for sure. Um, I was going to ask you, because you were saying about the social skills group, um, I was, what we do for our son is we do the positive parenting. There's actually a resource called Strengthening Families that's in the community that the Sacramento County Office of Education provides, as well as Folsom Cordova Unified School District provides, um, which we went through and it has helped. But we also send them to social skills group and we send them to a private social skills group. And according to your research, you're saying that it's not as effective because we need to change the peer group. Is that correct? Well, here's the thing. I'm talking about group averages. So just because something, you know, a group average represents the average of like a whole bunch of kids. And this is, you know, how we need to talk about things in research. But the bottom line is for any individual parent, what is helpful for your child? So it just because like on average, social skills training or social skills groups for ADHD hasn't been that effective, it doesn't mean that's not true for your kid. So I would say if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Like if, if it's working for your kid and you're happy with how it's working and your kid is happy with it, then you know, keep doing it because like that's the, that's the most important thing for your family. If it's not working, 
then you know maybe you are starting to think about like what could be added. Yeah. Well, I would think about it for your kid. Like I, again, if you think it's working for your kid, then I would say don't worry about all the things that I just talked about. You know, just, just like like just celebrate that. But if you think it's not working, or if you're trying to think about like things that could be added to potentially make it more effective than it already is, then or than it is, um, then I would say potentially like as researchers and clinicians and parents, like can we think about ways to also target the peer group and peers' impressions of your kid?